Welcome Regen Ag Nation and thank you for joining us for part three of this series for residue breakdown. Um, oftentimes this is a fall activity for us and uh, today we want to start inside because we want to share with you some of the research that goes along with this process of increasing the rate of decomposition. Um, as we shared with you in the past, it's really important for multiple reasons, clean seed beds, disease suppression. Um, some additional to bring to light would be one, more fertility in the soil, more humus in the soil. We want these carbon materials to break down and we want them to be available in the springtime. So we wanna start by putting a couple of things up on the screen. We're gonna share some data with you and some research papers and uh, really get into and dive into the specifics that revolve around the processes, the optimal conditions, and then also the inoculants associated with this idea of breaking down materials in the fall. All right, so one of the most important things here is to understand, and this is a very basic thing, is that ultimately the fate of your crop residue depends largely upon whether you till that down into the soil, how much tillage you do, or if you leave it on top of the soil. Obviously, there's benefits and advantages of both. If you leave the material on the soil, it's going to reduce things like erosion of soils. Um, it's going to increase water infiltration rates, things like that. Uh, but ultimately, that decomposition is slowed because it's not in the soil where all these microbes are uh, that really act upon the material. Now, if we get into the tillage portion, um, obviously it breaks this material down a little bit more. It also subjects it directly to microorganisms whose functions are to break this down. But ultimately, that is the most important factor in the rate of decomposition. Now, we've come up with some additional metrics to really talk about how decomposition is influenced. And we've broken it into five factors. Uh, residue physical and chemical properties, soil water content, soil temperature, soil microbial biomass, and soil nutrient status. Let's quickly discuss each one of these individual. Residue physical and chemical properties include the type of residue. So wheat and millet stems are much smaller than corn stalks, for example. Additionally, the material that's shredded, mechanically tilled, or left unlargely undisturbed, as we mentioned earlier, is a big part of that physical characteristic. The smaller particle size created, um, it, it really creates more surface area to be acted upon by the soil and broken down by the mechanisms such as microbial decomposition. And now the chemical properties include the makeup of the actual material that's being broken down, which is really important. High carbon to nitrogen ratios uh, ultimately reduce the rate of breakdown as well as higher lignin materials. Now this would include cobs, stalks, stems, and roots of the material. Conversely, green plant materials such as leaves break down really rapidly, and this is due to their high nitrogen content and lack of fibrous material. When we look at soil water content, the research is going to show that maximum decomposition rates occur in majority of soils. Obviously, there's a lot of different types of, of soils but they occur at about 80 to 90 percent of field capacity. Um, essentially what that breaks down to is 40 to 50 percent. Uh, put simply, if the soil is oversaturated, it's going to force oxygen out of the system and slow the process. If the soil does lack moisture, then it's going to reduce the rates of decomposition as well. But we're better off on the wetter side than the drier side in general. Now temperatures, looking at soil temperatures, the optimal soil temperature range for residue digestion is between 80 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if you get above or below those temperature values, then the process ultimately slows down. But overwhelmingly, you can expect to see significant decomposition rates between 50 and 100 degrees in the soil. When you start to get between 50 degrees and 32 degrees, that activity really ceases to a great degree. Um, over 100 degrees and it's kind of the same thing. So 
it's actually the microbial biomass in that scenario going into a state where they're less active to protect themselves and survive. Soil nutrient status, let's talk about that for a minute. So microbes require nitrogen and other key minerals to decompose uh, organic particles in the soil. As we mentioned earlier, the higher the carbon materials, such as stocks like wheat stubble, it can be as high as 80 to one or 100 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. The microbes then in that situation, they're gonna need more available nitrogen in the soil in order to break this material down efficiently. Soil testing is one of the tools that we use to figure out how much free nitrogen we have and how much we'll be adding to this process. Obviously, if we add a lot of nitrogen into this equation, we're reducing potentially microbial populations. Um, so we wanna give it just enough in the system in order for it to really be firing efficiently and succeed. Now let's look at the microbial biomass itself. What does break down this material? Um, anything from worms to arthropods, bacteria and fungi, they're all responsible for residue breakdown, but microorganisms such as bacteria and fungi are obviously the heavy hitters in this process. Uh, the quantity and types of these microbes largely depend on the rate at which the crop residue decays. Soil and root disease causing microbes also fall into the category of decomposers. That's why they're there. They're actually helping us break these residues down but if populations rise significantly in the process, they're out of balance and soils lack beneficial microbe groups that are decomposers as well, it can result in significant disease pressure the following season. This is why it's essential to use inoculants that augment this process and increase the populations of plant growth promoting microbes. Now keep in mind that almost every input company uh, markets fall residue breakdowns. They have specific products that they use for that. I'm not sure that they all understand exactly how to efficiently accomplish this result. Uh, what those microbe groups do and what they provide in the process. And also they're, they're just not diverse enough and uh, robust enough to accomplish the task that we're after. Especially in the case of root crops or anything that we have high economic disease control and, and things that really matter in the process. All right, so I wanna drop some of these products up on the screen for you. What we've done is we've really broken them down into the, the amount of inoculant there or the concentration rate, uh, what the primary functions are of the specific microbes that are in there and the specific microbes listed on the label themselves. So as you can see in commercial inoculant number one, we've got five different strains of beneficial microbes and we've categorized them. So we've got three lignin and cellulose degraders, which is fantastic. We've also got a couple of pathogen suppression um, strains. And keep in mind that a lot of these strains do different things, but ultimately what we've listed or given you is their primary function. So this looks to be and appears to be a good product. Um, as we move on and pop up commercial inoculant number two, what we can see there is we've got four different types of microbes, which we've listed. Um, we've got two of them that are lignin and cellulose degraders primarily, one that is a nitrogen fixer, and one that's a pathogen suppression uh, product. Now. As you can see, we've listed all of these in green. Uh, you'll find out why in just a minute when we go to our solution and kind of how we look at this. But ultimately, what I wanna point out here is, is that the counts are su sufficient to take care of this. So the data will show us that in order to successfully introduce these inoculants into the system, we have to have at least one times 10 to the fourth power, but ultimately up to the seventh or eighth power. So this is logarithmic. Um, most of them perform best and uh, they, they proliferate given the proper conditions if you're able to get into that fifth or sixth order as far as concentration goes. 
Also, it's really important to note that we want a diverse group of microbes here working together and doing things. So in a lot of the inoculants that we use, not only are there some very specific types, but also we have what we call helper um, groups within that set. So we're gonna pull up the Regen Agnation inoculant that we use in our fall breakdown materials. And I wanna just put that up on the screen right now so we can break this down as well. As you can see, we've got seven lignin and cellulose degraders. There's five types of microbes that are responsible for pathogen suppression. We've got seven different nitrogen fixers. Um, many of those, as we mentioned earlier, have to do with providing the type of nitrogen that it takes to bring these down. We would consider these helpers in this situation. Uh, we've got three associated with bioremediation. So what is bioremediation? Essentially, that is chemicals, or heavy metals that may be causing us issues in the soil as well. So those would be considered helpers overall to the process. And we've got one whose primary role is insect suppression as well. It's a total of 23 different strains and uh, really diverse. All right, so let's look at these two groups that we have highlighted in yellow. Now, one of them is an extremely efficient cellulose degrader. Uh, through the research, it's been targeted as one of the most highly efficient. The other one is a fungi that is actually one of the most efficient lignin degraders. It, and we're going to pop some data on the screen right now just to show you some of that research so you can see for yourself. So a couple things that's really important to understand is that in many cases, it's not the actual microbes that are breaking this material down, but rather it's important to note that a lot of the enzymes that are created by the microbes are actually what's breaking this material down. Um, in the case of lignocellulose biomass, it's been widely studied in wood rotting Bacchiomyces organisms. These Bacchiomyces are categorized as white rot and brown rot fungi. White rot fungi are the most effective biodegraders of lignocellulose biomass material and can degrade lignin faster than other microorganisms. To put that in simple terms, right, white rot fungi produce a number of extracellular enzymes that directly attack lignin, cellulose, and hemocellulose of the plant cell, cell wall to decompose it. I also want to put a highlight on another type of uh, bacteria that you actually see within commercial inoculant one. Bacillus lichenoformis is one of the primary degraders of wheat straw. So you guys can read this study through, but essentially the important takeout on this is that wheat straw contains a high level of silica on the outer surface and also a hydrophobic uh, extracts. So what the bacillus lichenformis does is it actually degrades that outer surface of the wheat straw so that these other microorganisms can go to work on it and further break it down. In other words, this is the first part of the process if you are trying to bring down, bring down wheat straw and residue. So if we're able to destroy that waxy cuticle on the outer surface of these materials, it will become more wettable and it can be acted on by other microbes that can further break it down and decay the material efficiently. So one more thing that I think is really important to note, what does this material look like in terms of chemically what it's made of? So 40 to 60% of it is roughly lignin when we let it get to um, a high lignin, such as uh, wheat straw or roots or corn cobs or whatever. Uh, cellulose is typically 20 to 40% of that and hemocellulose is roughly 10 to 25% of that lignin. So it takes multiple strains and it takes multiple micro microbes to essentially carry this process out and get it done. Now in good soils that are healthy and very diverse, we probably have many of these groups, but in other soils, um, just by the way we farmed them over time, we have to add these 
micro groups in in order to pull this off. So now that we've explored some of the science behind this activity, we want to take you out to the field and update you on where we're at three weeks later. All right, so I'm just going to drop you with a quick recap here. So it's been three weeks since we sprayed this residue digestion um, mix onto the soil. What's happened since then is they've gone and they've disked that material in. They've actually gone and plowed this material under. Um, as you can see, as you look out over the field, you don't see hardly any residue on top. Um, we have actually excavated a little bit of that material, which we'll show you in just a minute. But it's been three weeks since that time frame. We've got about three weeks really of good, strong weather. And the reason we say that is because soil temperatures impact the biology greatly and how active they are. Uh, soil biology will continue to be active in breaking down this material. And once you start to get around 50 degrees in soil temps at a constant, um, obviously it fluctuates a lot this time of year throughout the, the night and the day, but once you start to go below about 50 degrees, you'll see a significant reduction in overall activity. One way to measure that is through respiration. We've got some very simple respiration tests that we can do to measure how active your soil is and how active your biology is. But what we know is if the biology is not active, they will not be breaking down the material like we really want to happen in this field. So I want you to follow me over here. We're gonna look at some different states that this, uh, this wheat chaff in this example is under as it's breaking down. Come on over. All right, so what we've done at this point is we've excavated some of this material, which you can see in a pile here. We've kind of sifted it just so we could get an idea. Some of this material is really, really small and fine, and it's really starting to be broken down well. Um, you've got some other stuff that is obviously significantly bigger. It's been chewed through by the mechanical nature. And then you've got some stuff that, you know, it's pretty apparent that it's being acted upon by the biology. It's getting really thin. Um, some of those layers are much easier to be digested. Um, other ones are different, and that's all based on how much lignin is in this material. Um, but as you can see from looking at this, it's breaking down really, really nicely in the soil. We've got about three weeks of solid weather, you know, kind of 60s, 70s in the afternoon, getting down to about 45, 50 at night. So we'll continue to have good activity and good breakdown in this material for another three weeks. It's not too late to go in and start this process right now because we'll make some good impacts. Um, but what we've done from a mechanical standpoint and also the residue management with the products that we applied, it seems to be very successful up to this point. All right, so where do we go from here? Okay, um, we're gonna be looking at going into this field now and we'll, we'll go ahead and make our dry amendment materials. We'll go ahead and put that, broadcast that on with an air spreader. Um, that's significant because it's providing fertility that's needed by the crop in the next season. It's providing biological fertilizers that are miner mineralized more naturally rather than being water soluble and having salts and things that go along with this. So uh, we'll get that dry amendment on. There'll also be some liquids that will go into bed. Um, we can do some activities there that reduce soil pests and diseases along with the fertility. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and dry spread, then we'll bed up, we'll put some additional fertility in those beds and everything will be ready to roll for next spring. Um, that's kind of where we're at. That'll all occur in the next 10 days and we'll be off to the races. So we want to thank you for joining us. And remember when you're farming, make it fun because there's a lot of challenges and a lot of problems to solve. And it's a lot of fun in the process.